Welcome to my podcast from Chaos to Peace with Connie. I am Connie Graf and your host, and I will explore with you how a few minutes a day can keep the chaos away. And with chaos, we're talking about the physical, digital, social, financial, mental, emotional, and spiritual clutter that can accumulate in our life and business. In every episode, I want to make you aware how clutter is so much more than you think, how it affects your finances, and how clearing your clutter leads to more time, more money, and more peace. Let's go. Well, hello, my friend. Welcome to the podcast. I am Connie Graf, your host. Thank you so much for allowing me back into your ears. I'm very excited to welcome Victoria Pelletier as a guest today. Victoria is a 20 plus year corporate executive, board director, number one selling author and a prolific motivational and inspirational speaker. She wrote a book called Unstoppable, Stories of Changemakers Who Dare to Make a Difference. And her next book is about to come out called Influence Unleashed, Forging a Lasting Legacy Through Personal Branding. In our conversation, we're talking about how she had to overcome adversity in her childhood, which led her to create a life of no excuses, and this made her unstoppable. This turned into her being the youngest chief operating officer at 24, a president by 35, and a CEO by 41. We talk about whole human leadership and what that means, the importance of personal branding and its impact, and the power of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our workplace and our workplace cultures. Okay, without further ado, let's jump into this powerful conversation with the unstoppable Victoria Peltier. Welcome, Victoria. I'm excited to have you as a guest on a podcast. How are you today? I'm fantastic. Thanks for having me, Connie. I'm so glad you're here. So please tell my audience, who would, we, I have an international audience, tell my audience where in the world are you located? And then I always ask my guests too, to tell us something surprising about them that has nothing to do with what we're talking about afterwards. Uh, so I'm a very proud Canadian. However, I live very, very far south in the United States. I live in Miami Beach, Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I think my Canadian blood, although very accustomed to the snow, uh, wanted to escape it. So that's one of the things I love about being down down here. Mm -hmm. And surprising fact, um, well, it won't be so surprising now that I said I'm Canadian, but that I play hockey. I've played hockey for 20 years, although there's very little of that down here in Florida. Um, so I, I miss it greatly, but it's one of the things that uh, I've loved the most in terms of one of my like fitness activities over the last uh, many years. Wow, I do find that very surprising. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Swiss and we have lots of hockey in Switzerland and I live in Canada now where there's lots of hockey, but I don't play hockey. So I do find it surprising, but it's awesome. <laughs> I only watched hockey when I was younger. I watched a lot. So yeah. Yeah. So awesome. So let's dive in because you curated a life of no excuses. And I heard you say that because you had to overcome so much adversity early on in your life, uh, you were so driven to and became unstoppable. Can, us, can you give us the condensed version of what got you here to be unstoppable and living a life of no excuses? For sure. Uh, so I overcame pretty extreme trauma in my youth. I was born to a drug addicted teenager who was quite abusive to me. And so I went in and out of the child welfare system uh, a number of times. And I was fortunate, however, to be adopted uh, by a loving family. However, they were lower on the socioeconomic sort of totem pole, if you will. And so when my mom told me when I think I was 11, she's like, Tori, you need to be better than us. And she meant vocationally, educationally wise. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, she didn't need to say those things because those two aspects of sort of the trauma and the biology and circumstance I was born into, and then just kind of where we sat socioeconomically um, and the circumstances behind that, that became kind of my fuel, my drive, my why, if you will, because I was determined I'm going to be better than 
again, biology or circumstance. And that, uh, although I only started using the unstoppable term probably 10 or 15 years ago, that was really my nature. And so it was overcoming a significant amount. However, I will say there's a little bit of DNA in that as well, you know, fight or flight. I'm a fighter. And so for me, the no excuses, the unstoppable is a re meaning that I personally will not let any obstacle, challenge, or adversity stop me from achieving the goal or objective I've set for myself. Mm -hmm. And no excuses, which drives my children crazy, uh, mm -hmm. is more the fact that we have choice. And it doesn't mean that we don't deeply feel the emotion that occurs when one of these things happens to us, mm -hmm. but we have a choice in terms of how we're going to move forward and deal with that. Um, and so that, that's what it's all about for me. And that's how I live my life. I find it interesting that you say that you have some DNA in you to be a fighter because um, I just read the book Willpower Doesn't Work by Dr. Benjamin Hardy and he says the environment shapes how we are and so the w when you would go by that then your environment like you said on the lower scale of the sociological um, level would have maybe suggested that you're staying there, right? So you do think, or no, ask differently. Do you think we do need to have a certain buck in ourselves to be a fighter rather than taking on the environment? Or can we learn to become a fighter? I um, I think it's a little bit of both. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I think you're the, the the innate nature, like you're either, you know, born with a certain mindset or not. I think, so I do think there's some of that ju that just is there in that DNA. However, mm -hmm. I do believe that you can learn to be resilient, that you can learn to, you know, live with a very different philosophy versus what you might actually like feel like that you, you might alternatively like want, want to do. So I don't think it's either or, I think it's both. However, I do lean a little bit more heavily into learning and modeling thoughts, action, behaviors that get you towards your goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think he said that too. He just said the environment has such a big effect on you that it you're almost doomed to stay in the environment. So you have to get out of the environment. But... Yeah, I, so I, I love it. I, I love also that um, unstoppable. I I kind of see myself a little, maybe not as a, <laughs> not as crazy uh, and in a really positive way as you are. Um, but you were very young, so you you were really on the achieving and on the um, trajectory to go to places towards the moon because you were the youngest chief operating officer at the age of 24 and then a president by, by 35 and a CEO at age 41. I have to read this so I get it right because it's very impressive. Um, so that that got you there and now you're you're an expert in in leadership right and so I want to talk with you about leadership because you have a different approach you you call it whole human leadership. So what is the significance and, and why did you end up here? So that has to do with your story, I would think. Yeah, it. Um, so my expertise in leadership comes from the fact that I have been a leader now for over 30 years. My first leadership role was at age 14. I became the assistant manager of the shoe store that I worked at while I was in high school. Uh, and I, I actually, that, that's a passion for me. I thought I was going to be a lawyer. Uh, but I, when I got into the business world, when I worked through, throughout university in, in leadership capacity, I realized how much I enjoyed that. However, I made some pretty significant missed steps, um, early in my, particularly my executive leadership roles. I learned in my like mid to late twenties that I had a nickname as the iron maiden. And that is a result of, I think a couple of things. One is my lived experience. Uh, I was very afraid to show vulnerability um, and talk about my lived experiences because I didn't want anyone to question whether I not only had earned my seat at the table, but also the dynamic. And this is the other piece as a woman in business. Mm -hmm. So for me, I showed up um, in leadership with a bit of a mask on. I was all business all the time. I'm not going to be vulnerable with you. We're going to get right to the heart of the agenda and get stuff done. 
And my leadership journey, I've, I learned that I needed to act very differently. Uh, and my my best friend uh, nicknamed me Turtle. And so that's, I'm a very tough exterior, very resilient, but actually inside I'm all soft and marshmallowy. Like I cry at the Humane Society commercials, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That That needed to show up in my leadership style. And so whole human leadership is the recognition of failure I had by showing up in a very particular way and how much better it was as a leader for me to be vulnerable, to be authentic, and to create the um, safe space for my team to do the same. So Mm -hmm. whole human leadership is about being vulnerable. It's about being authentic. It includes being transparent, but not not that we sacrifice performance in doing so, not that we don't um, operate with you know, to borrow Kim Scott's phrase from radical candor, right? Mm -hmm. That we're not going to be giving the feedback that people need to hear to move things forward. It's recognition of all of those things and how we show up and creating a a much better, again, environment uh, for our team. That that's where I spend a lot of my time coaching the, the, t- the team members that work for me, all of whom are leaders as well. Uh, and then whether it's standing on public stages, I have a book coming out on this topic. Uh, and it's, I'm hoping that people can um, learn to do it differently from the get go. There's things I wish my 20 year old self knew that I now do well into my 40s. Yeah. I agree. But then on the other hand, so like when we look back 30 years or even just 20 years, I think the time wasn't the same as it is now. So I had the nickname, you had the nickname Iron Maiden, I had the nickname Tough Cookie. But I think as women, we kind of had to be a bit that way because it was very like you couldn't really show emotions in the boardroom when you were the only woman in a way right because that right away it would be said oh you're just uh, like a teary-eyed whatever and of course that's why we don't have women usually right and so you kind of had to be this way and and it was really rare that you met somebody the, a man or somebody who identify, identifies as a man um, being more vulnerable. And if he was, then only in the one-on-one and for sure not in the boardroom. That's at least my experience. So I totally love where we go in the world towards more integrating these these areas. But I think that was just how it was back then in a way too. Otherwise you wouldn't have made it where you are. Right. I agree. I do. I think I've seen a, like a seismic shift mm-hmm. in business. And I, I actually think COVID helped with this in that you're, you're right. This is the way it's been done for all these years. And, and for many women felt, and I felt that I needed to show up much like my male counterparts. Again, I want to feel like as the only woman at the boardroom table, like I, I belong here. And so I think that's part of it, but also employees have demanded something very, very different. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I've I've seen an evolution. I think COVID helped. I think it, I I think the pendulum was already swinging, but when there became no separation, when we all worked from our homes, uh, the, you know, the desire to do things that gave us greater purpose and joy. And so I think a big part of, you know, whole human leadership as a, is to, help connect that for our employees, the work that they do, what kind of purpose and impact does it have in the broader scheme of things? Like if you're, you know, you know, putting cogs into a certain, like understand how that still, you know, contributes to the outcome. And so again, I think we employees want something very different. It's also known that, you know, employees don't just quit companies, they quit bosses. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, there's now a need to shift to a very different way of leading and the different type of environment uh, that employees want to work in, and in large part because there's been a talent shortage as well. And so employees could demand different. And so I think that's why leaders are needing to show up uh, differently in responding to that. I hope for many of them, it's just not lipstick on a pig and this is something that they maintain ongoing. Yes. And, but so now, of course, you say you, you come from the employee uh, level and you say employees um, expect and, and, and want something different. But I think there is like, I hear the other side where all the employers say, oh, we can't get 
decent employees anymore. So I'm thinking it also shifts what the workspace or the workplace and the companies expect from the employees then as a as a counter effect in a way, right? Yeah, I think I, I don't love the like social media headlines that came about around the great resignation, quiet mm. quitting, these kinds of things. Again, I think that's connected to what did what do the employees want? And they had very different expectations. So there was there was this challenge created for employers. But I think that becomes there, there needs to be a very hard look at one skill. So marry skills and look at it rather than just like role profiles, like at, at a macro level, start to distill that down to skills. Because again, technology is changing the way we all work. And even if if you don't think you work in a technology company, you do. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we all do. Yeah. It, it enables the way in which we all operate every day. Um, and so let's look at the skills that are required and both the technical or functional skills, as well as the human skills. I don't like calling them soft skills, the human skills um, and the importance around that. Find what gets people excited. I've got a, you know, a Gen Zer at home, or well, uh, not at home. I'm an empty nester now. My older one, who's you know 23, will be 24 in a few months. Um, they look at job security around the investment in their their um, professional development. So again, go back to skills. What skills are needed for today, and where is it evolving to as a combination of strategy, new product, services, and technology for future. And how are we building a path for them? That's that's how they're focused. And mm -hmm. so employers, yes, facing a challenge right now, but they need to start connecting the work that people do, again, purpose and impact, understand the skills that they have um, and where the skills are going and building a bridge for them. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'll say, Connie, is also around being really clear on how success is measured and what outcomes are being measured and the incentives associated with that. Because I worked in far too many organizations who say they want one thing, yet incent on something very different than can often drive incredibly poor behavior and then therefore low morale and low employee satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really love your answer because I just remember when I was young, 23, we didn't have these labels of Gen Z and all that that came later, I think. But I always heard to, oh, today's youth, they're useless, they don't want to work and, and our, our world is doomed. And I mean, that was, again, over 30 years ago. And it's always, it always seems like we're, we're, um, banging on the young young generation that actually moves us forward in a way right because it makes us have to change our set set ways that we're having <laughs> and so i i don't like i don't I, I i don't like all these labels although i understand sometimes why we have them so we kind of know exactly what we're talking or we think we know what we're talking about but this constant saying, oh, the young ones are not, um, they, are, they can't work anymore and we're all doomed. I, I don't like it. So I love your answer. Thank you very much. Um, I, you also said somewhere in an interview, I heard you say, um, there should be no schedules, only, only deliverables, right? And so that I think is also something that especially young ones require, right? They don't want to just come and sit in the office for 10 hours and 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 um, when they could, could do it in three, let's say like that, or, or that working from home is probably similar too. It's like, as long as I deliver what you ask me to do, I should be able to do it wherever I want to do it. Is that what you mean with it? Or do you have more, a deeper meaning in this? Uh, it it means a couple of things, and one of which is the way in which you descri described it, Connie. And so for me, that there are no schedules, just deliverables has been like a mantra that I've had and it long before COVID ever hit. In fact, I always created um, the flexibility and capacity for my team uh, around how they got their work done. So you didn't have to ask me for permission to leave early for a doctor's appointment or a children's sporting event. We have commitments to our teams internally and to our clients or customers externally. And so be clear on what outcomes we are expecting, what deliverables we need to provide and by when. Although I actually also say manage my expectations if I'm too aggressive on when those deliverables are to be met. And sometimes 
we don't have flexibility, you know, you know, cash is king and that comes from our clients. And so sometimes we're, you know, mm. need to, to work more aggressively on those things. And so I mean it in that way, um, in that I want to focus on the outcomes, what, how success is going to be measured, what deliverables we have. And when you choose to get that done, I, I don't really care, to be honest. Um, but it's also about creating trust with our teams. Mm -hmm. And as if, again, COVID didn't prove that we could all work remotely. And in, in fact, productivity was higher. I think of my my time, you know, in some of the largest cities where I was, you know, in North America commuting, and we're talking one to two hours each way. Like, mm -hmm. how much more productive am I being able to like eliminate that, uh, you know, from my my schedule? And, you know, seeing bums in seats, as they say, doesn't mean that people are actually being productive. So I think going back to creating safe spaces, creating trust, um, and that comes with flexibility and allowing our teams to work in a way that is also more aligned to, I don't like this, as I said, whole humans, we show up, our experience, what happened to us on the weekend shows up at, at work. We're working out of our homes in many cases. So let's just recognize it's all life. Don't ask me about balance. For me, it's work-life integration. Let's figure out how to make it all work. Um, and that is another part of like how I believe we should be leading in business. So no schedules, just deliverables means many things. Um, but I think ultimately, again, should be the way in which we're we're leading and, and operating going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, when... It, it's more about control when we're saying like, you have to sit here in the office for eight hours for me visible it's control but it's counterproductive and and i i think like i had i had early on a boss when i was 22 or so i had a boss i was so good at my job to brag a bit <laughs> <laughs> that actually i replaced one and a half employees that they had before and i could go home early because he said as long as you pick up the phone when the phone is ringing you can be wherever you want to so i i there, there were innovative uh, bosses back then already, but I do really believe too that the pandemic helped. So many companies said, oh, we could never have remote workers that wouldn't work. They would just slack off and sit in front of the TV all day. And the pandemic proved it's not true. And yeah, the two hours of commute brings so much stress, right? That we could, that you could get more rested employees too, that then are more productive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I I love the term whole um whole human leadership. Where where do you put the DEI in it into it? The diverse diversity equity uh, I can't say <laughs> <laughs> diversity, diversity equity, and inclusion. Equity and, yes. Yeah, and inclusion. Man oh man this morning can't speak. Um so I would think that fits into this umbrella term as well it's a buzzword right now and it's a very important topic but i i love the term whole human leadership so much better talk about it, that. it is very much a part so it's hard to describe what i mean in whole human leadership in one sentence because as i said vulnerability and mm. authenticity mm -hmm. the way in which we communicate but a big part of that is also the who and how we um we lead in business and dei is a pretty significant part of that it's around recognizing, going back to skills, what are the skills that people have and what can be what can be taught? And so what I, you know, what I see is it's, you know, there's data that actually shows that um when we talk just from a gender perspective for a second, that women do not apply for jobs unless they believe they they meet nine or ten out of the ten skills criteria, where men typically do it with only five or six. Mm -hmm. So that's a confidence issue. Um mm -hmm. that that's one element. But the reality is, I think as a leader, um, it's incumbent upon me to identify potential and I can train and coach and mentor to the rest. And so I'm, I will very happily find someone that has very different di elements of diversity and diversity is so broad and there's a lot of intersectionality of those elements. So it's not gender, it's not just race, it's not just sex sexuality, it's lived experience, it's different functional experience within business, all these different elements. I want to create diversity within the team. And in doing so, I'm going to need to find people who don't have all of the skills and criteria, but I want to know that they also have propensity to learn. I also want to see that what, what do they bring to the team? How are they going to fit in? And again, it's my job to bridge that gap. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I have a phrase I use with many things and DEI is one of the places they use it as well around strategic intentionality. So if we want to move the needle on advancing diversity in our, our teams, our companies, our communities that, you know, much more broadly, then we need to be really strategic around how we attract talent. Where do we go and, you know, to find them and how do we keep them? So again, it's also you know, find, creating the right kind of inclusive environment where they feel like they can belong and they can show up as them, their whole selves. Again, that's part of being a whole human leader. Mm -hmm. and, and you say there is a crucial aspect of unconscious bias that we have to be aware of. So where, 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 where would you say we have to be careful? Because I think the unconscious bias is dangerous because it is unconscious, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, it is. In, and the unconscious bias is, you know, recognize that people do business with people they like and trust mm -hmm. and want to therefore do business with, or in this case, hire. And the biases that come is we like and trust people because we have shared interests, experiences, et cetera. And so if we're not breaking outside of that to find people that are different than us, mm -hmm. that have different passions, values, and experiences, um, then we we continue to do more of the same same all the time. And so there's a need to, mo most companies seem to be doing some kind of unconscious bias training, but the reality is it's unconscious by its nature. So this goes back to the, the, the intentionality. And so for me, it's let's be really clear about the place in which we're starting from and mm -hmm. hold one another accountable to the progress that's going to be made again in advancing or moving the needle forward. Mm -hmm. And so- that intentionality means, you know, as a hiring manager, if I get a slate of candidates that all look the same or come with the same educational experience, I need to be challenging the recruiter that's working directly with me. And I also, I need to be looking for those things um, as well to, to recognize, recognize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I, I'm trying to wreck my brain where I, I read somewhere, one leader, he said he has intentionally a right hand person that has the complete opposite um, way of looking at things to keep him in check. And I, like, while you were talking, I'm like, where did I read this and who, who was this? I forgot, but I thought it was so genius, right? He had, he had his vision, he, had, he knew where he wanted to go, but he had this naysayer almost, like he didn't call it that way, but I, yeah. it's my short version of saying it. He had this naysayer on purpose next to him who would constantly throw all the things at him, why this was not a good idea, why this doesn't work. I think especially to get his unconscious bias and all his um, um, blind spots uh, uncovered, right? So I, I thought that was well, genius. You know, I think that's great. And I think that's why actually we need to um, foster um, dissent in the workplace. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm at some point we can agree to disagree and there's a hierarchy for a reason. Mm -hmm. However, I want people to challenge me. Yeah. And um, one of the reasons I left, there are many reasons I left one of the organizations that I once worked for, but um, one of the biggest issues I saw was the CEO. She would, she only wanted to hire people or keep people around her that were basically yes people. They were never going to tell her no or challenge her. Mm -hmm. And that, that's so dangerous. That, it very, very going back to, again, more of the same. Mm -hmm. um, now, in this case, yay that it was a female CEO um, where there's far too many, particularly in the Fortune 500, um, but surrounding ourselves with people who aren't going to challenge our way of thinking uh, and doing uh, well, not it's, you know, what they say, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, you know, expecting different results, and expecting a different result. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or expecting to, to move, to move forward and, 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 um, make progress, yeah. which is probably not going to happen. Um, so now in a way we're talking always about the bigger corporations, but how can we get this down to smaller, like micro businesses that pop up everywhere too. I don't know how big your business right now is, but I'm basically a micro business with personal brands. How can we as smaller businesses take these whole human leadership and DEI ideas and incorporate them into our small little world? What, what would you suggest? Uh, so for, for me, it's, it's a philosophy and it's a mindset. 
And so if it's a micro business, no, you can't have representation across all areas of diversity because you might just not be large enough to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. However, as I said, it's mindset, regardless of whether you're a solopreneur and like using contractors or a business of 10, a hundred, a thousand, the reality is the way in which you show up and lead should not change regardless of business size. Again, I think it's a mindset and the philosophy in which, and the way in which you show up and that should not be different um, because of the size of your business. Uh, and there, I think there's opportunities, however, for micro businesses. So you might not have a ton of employees, but when you use contractors or vendors for other things, that's your opportunity then. You might not, you, you might have two employees, so you're not going to have a, potentially a ton of diversity. But yeah. how do you think about that when you're choosing the people that you're going to work with or hire to help support? So I think there's other ways of being and showing up regardless of size of business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what I would all, what I was also thinking, like when I was preparing for this interview and going a little bit through your material, I was thinking like, how can I attract a more diverse clientele too, maybe as a small business, right? So how would I have to show up or where, where are my blind spots? where I'm not showing up in a way that I present myself with this mindset. That's kind of what, what I was uh, wondering, right? Like in a way we, we, we attract kind of like with our energy, of course, what, what we do already. So I don't have, I, I noticed, I don't have an extremely diverse clientele, but that is not because I wouldn't want to have a more uh, diverse clientele. That's kind of where I was, um, where my question came from. Well, um, so one of the things I had, you know, will very much attribute my own career success to, and one of the areas I also spent a significant amount of time talking and coaching on is around your personal brand and how you show up. And so there's, um, four, four things I think are really important around brand. And most people like only focus on the first one. The first one is, you know, what do you do? What's your subject matter expertise? What industry do you know, et cetera? And most people go, okay, that's it. Well, no, like to my phrase earlier, people do business with people they like, trust, and want to do business with. So it's more than that. It's what you do and what your expertise is. The next part is what's your story? What, again, values, passions, interests, lived experience, what elements do you want to, because that builds connection with people. Mm -hmm. The next one is what makes you different from others? What's kind of that unique value proposition? So why would someone choose to hire you versus someone else who has that same expertise or experience as you do? Um, mm -hmm. And then the last one is legacy and impact. And like, what do you want to be known for? And once you've cu curated all of those, those are all elements of your brand. You then need to think about where you're going. Like, who's the audience that, you know, I want to attract um, whether that's because you want to be hired, um, you want to sell to someone, um, whether it's because, you know, you want to get a book deal, what, whatever the goal or objective is and who's that audience, you need to understand the message that's important to them and connect it back to that broader brand. Um, that's that combination of those, those four areas I shared. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. I will have to <laughs> start looking into that and thinking about that. Yeah. And, and getting more clear around it, let's say like that. So I, before, before we want to wrap up, I want to ha have one more question. So if we pull out the crystal ball now, <laughs> what, what do you see where we're going with all of this whole human leadership with this DEI? Did you have any, any insights where the future of our work will be? Um, well, I hope that this kind of leadership and creating, you know, greater DEI within our workplaces becomes just standard. What we've seen over the last number of years is there's mandates to do it, whether it's, you know, the NASDAQ or S&P um, requiring diversity on boards and within the workplaces. I hope that just becomes the, the way we operate, period. Mm -hmm. uh, and where I see that going, there is recognition. Today, it's it's more people see it as the right thing to do or because they're legislated to do it. But the reality is it it there's data that proves the results of doing it, whether it's increase in innovation and problem solving, the reduction of risk by having greater diversity in the workforce, 
the fact that we see higher performance because people feel like they belong, they're much more engaged and therefore their productivity rises. So I see this being much more of the standard way of operating versus the way we talked about that you and I would, it might've seen 20, 30 years ago in business. Mm -hmm. That was much more of this top down approach. Mm -hmm. I see this changing and becoming much more of the way of the future. Oh, that would be, I, I think that would be wonderful is maybe the wrong word. No, that would be, that would be awesome because to me, it's like, okay, it should just be normal. It, and, and, and I don't mean normal with what we usually call normal, which is mostly sick, but just so, so a given, just a given, maybe that's the better word than normal, a given. Yeah. So where can people find you if they're now intrigued uh, about what we were talking about? You tell us a little bit, where can they find you? What do you do for your clients? And also about your new book. I'm excited. Awesome. Well, uh, so I have a website, which is victoria-peltier.com. And then people can choose to link out and connect with me on whatever other social media platform they choose, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Um, although I will also say, if you just Google me, that should hopefully demonstrate that I've been very focused on my personal brand for a long time because I will come up everywhere. <laughs> uh, and then in terms of the work that I do beyond being a C-suite executive I am a professional public speaker and I talk in a number of topics around resilience, personal branding, leadership and culture, DEI. Um, and I also do a limited amount of coaching on a, a few of those topics. And two books are coming out. Actually, one is on personal branding. That one's going to come out in early 2024, likely in February. Uh, and then a few months later, I will have one coming out on whole human leadership and how to advance that forward in our, uh, in our businesses. Oh, wow. I will put those two books on top of my very long list. So I'm an avid reader, but the list of books I want to read is also very long, but I'm very interested in those. Um, awesome. So before we wrap up, in, do you have any last words or did I not ask you something that you feel like that should still belong in this uh, conversation that we had or anything else that comes to your mind that you want to say? I, um, no, you asked me a lot. So that's great, Connie. Thank you. Um, you kept me on my toes for sure. The one thing I would state is part of being unstoppable, um, is recognizing that, you know, you are the CEO of you brand mm -hmm. you. And so you curate and define the narrative in which you want people to know you. So going back to sort of personal brand, but also whatever your version of success looks like for you you are in control and then connected to that no excuses. You make a choice in terms of how you're going to achieve that goal or objective for yourself and move forward. So I want people to recognize that they have control and can claim power over their careers or more broadly, like even personally, the goals or objectives that they set for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I totally agree. Thank you. That very beautiful last words. Thanks so much, Victoria, for your time. Thanks for having me.